Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Think about the most exciting event in your life. Maybe it was graduating from college. Maybe it was getting that big promotion. Maybe it was getting married. Maybe it was winning a state tournament, wrestling or basketball or softball. Maybe it was the birth of a child. But whatever it was, think about that event. Remember the excitement, the joy, the emotional high that you felt. We've all had these moments in our life. And for the Jews following Jesus, Palm Sunday is that high point. You see, in their minds, the Messiah had come, he had revealed himself, and now he was about to usher in the earthly Israeli kingdom. And they've been waiting for this for centuries. And yet they misunderstood. They were looking for an earthly savior. And Jesus is the eternal savior and king. And so as we examine Palm Sunday, we need to understand the true claim of who Jesus is. And we answer the question of what is the true claim? What is the actual claim of Palm Sunday? Now I'm aware that many of us know the story of Palm Sunday so well, you could recite it better than I can read it. And these occasional messages are always the hardest for me for that reason, because you all know the stories. You've heard it preached hundreds of times, dozens at least, and there isn't really much new to be said. So, with that in mind, what I would like to do today is to go through this familiar story and not add anything new. I probably will just repeat the same things you've heard about the crowd and the donkey and the prophecy. And what I want us to understand is, is not new. But rather, what I want us to do is to appreciate again what we know to be true. To help us not take for granted the fantastic thing which happened in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. See, as this event is probably the third most important event in Christianity, first being Easter, second being Christmas, and here we are, the third, Palm Sunday, <coughs> when an obscure carpenter's son, set into motion the final events of his ministry, which changed the world forever. And so as we enter into the story today, we find Jesus and his disciples on their way to Jerusalem for Passover. They've all done this dozens of times before, most likely. Now, as we've talked about, uh, this was always the time when Jesus was going to fulfill his ministry, meaning that at the end of these three years of ministry, Jesus had reached the culmination of his ministry, and it's time to fulfill his purpose as Savior, to take on the sin of the world and die in place of sinful humanity. And Jesus knew this. It seems as if he was the only one who knew this. And so for his followers, most likely even the twelve, they were simply going to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover with their teacher. It was the normal celebration for them. And so as we turn to the story according to Mark, turn to Mark chapter 11, and we will get to see the story again. Mark chapter 11. Now, as they approached Jerusalem, near Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, and he said to them, Go to the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here soon. So they went and found a colt tied at a door, outside in the street, and untied it. Some people standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying that colt? They replied as Jesus had told them, and the bystanders let them go. 
Then they brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Both those who went ahead and those who followed behind kept shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. And after looking around at everything, he went out to Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. So the first thing that we're going to discuss this morning is the cult and its important symbolism. We see that the cult is importantly symbolic. This is probably one of the most well-known points here, and it is the fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, 9, which reads, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is legitimate and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a young donkey, the foal of a female donkey. And so, as I said a moment ago, Jesus knew that this was the time, and he knew this prophecy. And so I believe that he intentionally orchestrated these events, and so he uh, knew what he was doing, and he sends these two disciples to get this colt. And so these two disciples, they find this colt, the foal of a donkey, and has never been ridden. And the significance here is this idea of what is set apart for sacred use should not be used for uh, holy use. So the idea is that this colt had never been written, and therefore it was acceptable to be used for the holy purpose of allowing the Messiah to ride into Jerusalem. And so as we continue to verses 3 and 4, the focus on the colt is tied. And you see the word tied and untied like six times in this section. And it seems that this takes us back to Genesis 49, uh, which is where Israel prophesied about his sons, telling them this is what's going to come of you all. And we get to the section on Judah in verse 10, and uh, Jacob tells him that the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. The nations will obey him, binding his foal to the vine and his colt to the choicest vine. And so the allusion here uh, to this colt brings us all the way forward to Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And he who comes to whom it belongs, as quoted from verse 11, is a reference to the Messiah, the one to come. The point is, lest we get too technical, is this points directly to Jesus as the Messiah. We're looking at a prophecy all the way back from the man Israel to his sons, and we're seeing it fulfilled in Jesus as he's riding this colt into Jerusalem. Just as a by the by, Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. I will try to only say Messiah today, but we say Jesus Christ so much, it just kind of gets stuck in my head too. So Messiah and Christ both mean the exact same thing. It's just one is transliterated Hebrew and one is transliterated Greek. Uh, but they both mean the anointed one. Now, the fact is that these bystanders, uh, they just let him go. And a lot of people have a lot of trouble with this. How is it that these random bystanders were, oh, well, the Lord needs it, so you can just go. What? Well, see, the problem is the Lord is capitalized in almost all of our Bibles. It's in every version that I looked at. Lord is capitalized. Here's the problem. While it is properly understood as a reference to Christ, these bystanders would not have understood it that way. These bystanders would have heard Lord as in master, as in landlord, as in landowner. That is the owner of this donkey. What they would have heard the disciples saying to them is, we're, we're servants also of the owner of this donkey, and he wants the donkey. So we're going to come get the donkey and go. 
And the bystanders have been like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. The person who owns the donkey wants to use the donkey ready to go. Uh, certainly there is some double entendre going on here in that Jesus is God who does in fact own this donkey and the whole world. Uh, and in Matthew, it's quite explicit, this double entendre that's going on. Mark fails it much more. But the point remains, we sit here and scratch our heads as 21st century readers going, well, that doesn't make any sense. These random bystanders are just letting him steal this donkey? Well, no, because to them, it sounded like they had the authority of the owner of the donkey. And there is a whole theory that the literal owner of the donkey was also with Jesus, uh, and Jesus had made arrangements with this owner to use this animal. You can't prove that it happened. You can't prove that it didn't happen. It's possible. I don't know that it adds anything to the story. But anyway, there you go. Here's the point. Even if Jesus did intentionally prearrange, it in no way negates the fulfillment of the prophecy. Right, so the big picture point here is that Jesus is the Messiah. And so we just talked about how this fulfills the prophecy in Zechariah and the prophecy in Genesis and many other prophecies to boot. But it's the idea that even if it was done intentionally, Jesus knowingly manipulated these situations, it's still the fulfillment of prophecy, which makes the point that Jesus is the Messiah. Next, we see the people honoring Jesus as king. So, the disciples bring the colt back, they put their cloaks on it, and Jesus sat on it. Many others placed their robes on the ground in front of them, along with the branches they cut from the field. This bears resemblance uh, to 2 Kings 9, 12 through 13. This is where Jehu is anointed king. Let me just read this to you, 2 Kings 9, starting in 12. So he, that is Jehu, told them, that is the standers by, what he, that is the prophet, we lost yet, had said. He also related to them, that is the standards by, how the prophet had said, this is what the Lord says, I have designated you king over Israel. And each of them quickly took off his cloak, and they spread them out at Jehu's feet on the step. The trumpet was blown, and they shouted, Jehu is king. So the idea is uh, this picture. My point in bringing up the scripture is to demonstrate this picture. The idea of a king being proclaimed, of taking off cloaks, laying down these branches, and ushering a king in with great pomp and circumstance and celebration. Whether the crowd had this specifically in mind or not uh, is, again, you can't really prove either way. I would argue they probably didn't, but here's the point. The point is we see a pattern of the way Jews behave when they're ushering in a person they call king. That is namely, great pomp and circumstance and the laying of cloaks on the ground and on the donkeys and the whole hallelujah. And so as the crowd went along before and behind Jesus, they sang, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And so here we see a parade. They are giving great honor and praise to Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem. This is as if a king returning victorious. Now likely you know that this quote, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, is from Psalm 118, 25 and 26. We know that Hosanna means Lord, deliver us. And so as the crowd shouted, Hosanna, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We see that they praise and worship Jesus as the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I know this is totally outside of the scripture and earth shattering. The point is that they are acknowledging Jesus as this Davidic king. This is the one who comes as a representative of the Lord is representative of Yahweh. Now, interestingly, in this case, we see another one of these double, I don't think double entendre is the word I want, but these double meanings, right, where we see they are uh, praising Jesus as the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and indeed, Jesus is the Lord. 
And we understand that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. And so it is literally the Lord who is coming and they are praising. And the following phrase, blessed, is the coming kingdom of our father David. This is making the acknowledgement that Jesus is the son of David. This is the promised Messiah, right? Attached to this promised Messiah is the idea of an offspring of David, the Davidic king, to come and set up a literal kingdom. It says the literal Israeli kingdom coming. I think we're at part three here. In the third portion, we see the shout of the crowd, Hosanna in the highest. Implied is the praise to Yahweh, who is the highest and who dwells in the highest heaven. And so the point is that the crowd is claiming that Jesus is the king. And they are expressing their expectation of him to come in and set up a kingdom. Now, of course, this picture is one of earthly significance. The people in the crowd here expecting Jesus to set up the new Israel now. This is a victory parade intended to ultimately end in the vanquishing of these terrible Romans and the establishment of the Israeli kingdom. And the people are looking for an earthly savior. You see, their picture of the Messiah was far too limited, and they grossly missed who the Messiah really was. You see, the true vision of the Messiah is an eternal one. He's the eternal savior and king the one who has come to save the world from their sins. Now, we've all had these overtly emotional experiences where excitement is high and uh, we get you know, all jazzed up and ready to go. And if we're in a crowd, if we're in an arena, all the more so. Uh, it's an exhilarating experience and that becomes contagious. So I wonder if, if we were to put ourselves there for a moment. And you hear the singing of the crowd, the shouts, Hosanna. You smell the aroma of unwashed bodies that have been walking for a day. Mixed together with the aroma of the animals as you're walking along in the warm spring weather. Envision the throng of people, shoulder to shoulder, walking down the road. In the middle of all of this commotion is Jesus riding on the donkey and the people shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And mistaken though the crowd was at the extent of who and what was happening in this picture, right they were in seeing the arrival of the Messiah. And that is the proclamation here. That Jesus is the Messiah and he has come, Savior and King, entering into Jerusalem. See, that is the true claim of Palm Sunday. That Jesus is the Messiah, the eternal Savior, King. And this was the high point of his ministry. And I hope you understand what I mean by that. It's from a human perspective, right? This is the triumphant moment. The people have rallied around him in anticipation. I'm sure his disciples were more excited than they'd ever been in following him. This claim has been made clear. The crowd is on board. Everybody is, is, uh, is rallying behind the cause. The Messiah is here. The king has arrived. And yet, though the people are mistaken, Jesus is not. Jesus is fully, painfully aware of what the next week will hold. And he knows that none of the crowd's expectations are going to come to pass. At least not in the way they expect. He knows that all of them will abandon him. He knows that there is no turning back from his purpose and call. And he knows that now is the time when he will take on the sin of the world. Die alone in our place. So what does this mean for us? First, to reiterate, it means that the clear point is that Jesus is the Messiah. And so what are you going to do about this Messiah? And I hope we don't take this for granted again 
we see this year after year after year, right? We come and we meet, and sometimes we do our procession, and some some years we miss it, and and we hear over and over again, oh, there's a donkey in a crowd, and we're singing in Jesus and Messiah. Okay, all right, it's time to eat. Let's go. You see, we must not miss this claim. We must determine for ourselves. If not for the first time, then again as a renewed commitment, they acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, that Jesus took on my sin and died in my place. And he rose again from the dead, victorious over sin and death. The Bible says that there is no other name by which a person can be saved, only by faith. Jesus Christ. Now, assuming that this is so, the next thing for us to do is to meet Jesus right here at this crossroads. And as we enter into the final week of Lent, what we refer to as Holy Week, we find a new appreciation for the Savior who knowingly and willingly went to the cross. We have an awareness and appreciation that he knew what was coming and didn't turn back. Over the past several weeks, we've been studying the spiritual disciplines, and uh, you've been intentionally practicing these, and you've been enhancing uh, Lent through these practices. And so as you've drawn nearer to God, you've gotten closer to Jesus. You've seen new things to confess, found new ways to experience God's grace in order to gain a new appreciation of your Savior and what he walked through in these final weeks leading up to the cross. It's all said and done, the purpose of Lent is that, to come to the end of Lent with a new, a renewed, a refreshed appreciation for what Christ has done for us. And then we can gather together on Easter Sunday and celebrate his victory with a new zeal. And so, as you approach this next week, I encourage you to take the time to read Mark 14 and 15. Uh, These chapters quite briefly walk through uh, Jesus' last days before the crucifixion. And it is my prayer that you will take advantage of this time to to prayerfully uh, consider what Jesus went through to meet him there day by day on his way to the cross, that we may experience a renewed gratitude for Jesus' sacrifice and a new excitement and a new zeal to celebrate as we gather next Sunday on Easter Sunday. So today we explored the story of Palm Sunday again, and we answered the question, what is the true claim of Palm Sunday? We saw that the people believed Jesus to be the Messiah, and this event fulfilled prophecy to the end. Yet the crowd misunderstood, and the people had the wrong idea of who and what was happening. And we saw that the true claim of Palm Sunday is that Jesus is the Messiah, not just an earthly Savior, but the eternal Savior. Thank you. Would you pray with me? Lord our God, we worship you. We are so thankful for your son, Jesus. We are thankful for these several weeks of Lent in which we may draw near to you, which we may repent, which we may consider the cost which you paid and the cost which Christ paid for our sin. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be firm in our decision to trust and believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again from the dead. And even this week, as we uh, day by day walk through, according to the scriptures, Jesus last week, we may come out the other side, having met him at the cross, confessing again, having a renewed appreciation and zeal, that we may gather together next Sunday in earnest celebration 
and true appreciation, rightly understanding the price that was paid for our victory over sin. All of this for your glory, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus.